clown house. I'm a single male and started looking for a house to buy a couple of months ago. The market was insanely competitive. Every time I found a house I liked, somebody else's offer had already been accepted before I even had a chance to look at the place. It was crazy. So when an attractive two-story craftsman-style house in a nice neighborhood within my price range was listed, I got aggressive. I had never owned a house before and based off of the photos, this was the place. It was everything I had been hoping for. If I were able to get this one, I would look back and be happy that all the previous houses I was interested in didn't work out for me. I thoroughly scanned through all of the available pictures of the house, of which there were many. I actually knew a few people who lived in the area, so I knew the neighborhood was to my liking. So taking all things into consideration, I was confident enough to make an offer sight unseen. I even waived all contingencies. On top of that, I made it a cash offer. I was both joyous and nervous when my offer was accepted and the seller was hot to close. The closing was scheduled immediately and I was officially the owner of the house before I ever even stepped foot in it. It was risky, but I rolled the dice. After the closing, I finally walked through the house, gave it an exhaustive looking over, and breathed a huge sigh of relief. Everything looked up to snuff. The lone spot I had yet to check out was the attic. It was the only portion of the house that didn't have any pictures in the listing. The attic was in the upstairs hallway. It was a pull-down attic where one pulls a string and a ladder unfolds from the ceiling. The ladder came down nice and easy, and it was very sturdy as I climbed up. I stuck my head through the opening, but it was so dark up there that I couldn't see much. Fortunately, I could see a string light bulb overhead. I hoisted myself up into the attic, pulled the string, and the attic was illuminated. I must have jumped three feet in the air and let out a scream like a little girl when I spotted four figures standing against the wall. It took me a good 15 seconds to get my wits about me and ascertain what I was looking at. Mannequins. Four life-sized mannequins. And these weren't just your run-of-the-mill average mannequins. They were clown mannequins. And these weren't cheap. These were well designed and detailed. The first clown looked happy with its goofy smile, fiery red hair, bulbous nose, and oversized shoes. The next clown had short blue hair. It was white-faced with blue stars surrounding both eyes. Its blue mouth curled into a fun smile. The third clown had yellow hair and a peach-colored face with white circles around his eyes and smiling mouth. All three of them made a nice, jolly trio. The final clown was much different than the other three. First of all, he was set apart from the others as if he weren't part of their group. He was a sad hobo clown with a crumpled tramp hat and a large frown wasn't the only thing he was holding. In his hand was a massive butcher knife. This would have freaked most people out. It didn't bother me though. I figured it was just some kind of Halloween decoration the previous owner left behind, and quite frankly, I was seeing nothing other than dollar signs. I figured I could sell them for at least a hundred bucks each. I left the attic and was feeling good about the house. I decided to go to a local restaurant to get a bite to eat. My plan was to spend the night in the house just to get a feel for it. I didn't have any furniture to move in yet, but had an air mattress in my car. After a nice dinner, I returned to my new home, blew up my air mattress, and laid myself down and fell fast asleep. I was awakened in the middle of the night by a fairly loud thud. It came from the attic. 
I figured one of the clown mannequins fell over, but wanted to confirm, so I pulled down the ladder stairs and climbed into the attic. What I saw was a bit perplexing. The blue-haired clown's head was lying on the floor in front of its body. I stepped deeper into the attic, stooped down next to the blue-haired clown's head, and took a closer look. It appeared that the head had been violently hacked off. My assumption was the head was already like that and had just been balanced in place on the body. Being that it wasn't properly affixed, it eventually succumbed to gravity and rolled off. I didn't think much of it and went back to bed. When I woke up the next morning, I washed my face, gave myself a quick five-finger combing of my hair, and started for the front door. That's when I noticed the slow, rhythmic creaking sound coming from above me. Again, I pulled the attic ladder down and climbed up into the attic. I gasped. The fiery, red-haired, happy clown had a noose wrapped around its neck and was swaying back and forth as it hung from a rafter. The end of the rope was being firmly held in the hobo clown's hands. There was no reasonable explanation for this other than someone had broken into my new house and was messing with me. I was furious. The very first night in my new house and I had an intruder. I know how to handle myself and had every intention of roughing up the intruder once I got my hands on them. Nobody was going to come into my new house, mess with me, and get away with it. I hurried down the attic ladder and did a quick search of the house, but I found no sign of anyone else having been there. I was still steaming and tried to call the police to report this, but my cell phone wasn't getting a signal, so I did the next best thing. I sped to the police station and reported this in person. The police took this seriously and wanted to take a look through the house for themselves, so they followed me back. When we pulled up into the driveway, my neighbor was out in his front yard watering his lawn. The police quickly questioned him to see if he saw or heard anything unusual. The neighbor shrugged and said he hadn't heard anything at all other than a chainsaw revving from inside my house. They asked him how long it had been since he heard the chainsaw. He replied, About a minute ago. A minute ago? The trespasser had to be back in the house. My blood was boiling. I wanted to get my hands on whoever the hell was messing with my new home. I took off like a flash into the house. I could hear the police running behind me yelling for me to stop and to wait for them, but I was like a man possessed and wanted to find this bastard. As I entered the house, I could hear the low hum of a running chainsaw. It was coming from the attic. I flew up that ladder like a maniac but stopped in my tracks at the sight I saw before me. The peach-faced, yellow-haired, happy clown was lying in pieces on the floor. The hobo clown was standing over him and was holding a chainsaw. The hobo clown's head was turned and he was staring directly at me. For a split second, I didn't even recognize him due to the fact that his trademark frown was no longer a part of his facial features. He was smiling. Rest stop. When I was 25 years old, I was in a long distance relationship with a man who lived in Orlando, Florida. I lived in Cincinnati. Each month, one of us flew to the other city to spend at least a weekend together. This particular time, I was the one traveling, but instead of flying, I decided to drive all by myself and I left fairly late at night. The majority of the roads were quiet, with the exception of the occasional trucker. 
At one point, I stopped and got some fast food, and something about the meal did not agree with my stomach. Within 30 minutes of eating, my stomach was churning, grumbling, and I was getting occasional sharp pains in my lower abdomen. I needed to find a bathroom, and quick. I was relieved when I saw a sign for a rest stop up ahead. I absolutely hate stopping at rest stops and almost never do, but I had to go to the bathroom so bad that if I didn't make an exception, I was going to have an accident. I pulled into the empty rest stop parking lot. The building was old and run down. I could see that it was dimly lit inside. It had an extremely gloomy and seedy feel to it. I seriously wish there were more people around. Honestly, had this not been an emergency, I would not have gotten out of my car. But my stomach gave me no choice. I rushed into the building and was met by the overwhelming stench of mildew. I hurried to the ladies' room, which was home to five stalls, a garbage can that looked like it hadn't been changed in weeks, and a filthy sink. To top it all off, the overhead fluorescent lights were flickering on and off. It was dirty and creepy. At this point, none of that mattered. I needed a toilet now. I sprinted to the last stall and made it just in time. After several minutes, just after I let out a breath of relief, I heard the ladies' room door squeak open and could hear heavy footsteps enter. I listened as one of the stalls further down rattled open and then heard the distinct sound of urine hitting the porcelain. This wasn't unexpected, I mean, this was a bathroom. What was startling was when the person cleared their throat in an exceptionally deep manner. It was a man. I was scared. I just had a creepy feeling about this whole thing. I was hoping that this was just an innocent man who mistakenly thought this was the men's room. I held my breath hoping he didn't realize I was in there. Then he spoke in a deep, hoarse voice. Little pig, little pig, let me come in. That was followed by the squeak of him pushing one of the other stall doors open, followed by the next one and the next one until I could see him moving outside the stall I was in. The stall door began to rattle as he tried to pull it open. I'm in here, I yelled, but it didn't deter him. He started pulling harder and then started pounding on the door. I started screaming as he began kicking the door. That flimsy door fastener wasn't going to hold up much longer. Then I heard the creak of the ladies room door opening, followed by a woman saying, Hey, what are you doing in here? This is the ladies room. I could hear the man run out of the bathroom. My heart was beating a mile a minute. I took several deep breaths to calm myself and exited the stall. The woman who had entered the bathroom could see the fear on my face and asked if I knew that guy. I told her I had no idea who that was and explained that he was trying to get into my stall. The woman was very sympathetic and walked me out to the restroom lobby where her boyfriend was waiting for her. He said that the guy ran past him and out into the parking lot. The couple walked me to my vehicle. They even checked inside my car to make sure that guy didn't try to hide in there. Fortunately, there was no sign of him. I didn't stop again until I reached Orlando. Cab Ride I'm a businesswoman and my job requires me to travel often. I called for a cab to pick me up outside my house and take me to the airport. I was still packing when I heard the cab honking its horn. I checked my watch. They were about 15 minutes early, but better early than late. I finished packing and stepped out to the cab. My baggage was light, so I brought it with me into the back of the cab, and the cab driver sped off. 
I am the type of person who likes to kill time in cabs by striking up a conversation with the driver. I broke the ice by saying, Nice night, huh? The cab driver didn't respond. He didn't even look in the rearview mirror to acknowledge I said anything. I thought maybe he was hard of hearing, so I asked him the same question again, only louder. Still, no response. This was odd. There was no way he didn't hear me. Could he really be that rude as to simply ignore me? I was about to ask him if he could hear me okay, when my phone dinged, indicating that I had a text message. It was from the cab company. The message read, I'm outside waiting for you. My heart stopped. I checked the time on the text and it was mere seconds ago. At first I thought maybe the cab company screwed up and sent two cabs to the same location, so I leaned forward and inquired with the driver. Uh, I just got a text message from the cab company saying that they were waiting for me outside my house. I was waiting for an explanation from the driver. Instead, he ignored me and pounded on the accelerator. I started yelling for him to slow down and he began laughing. It was a shallow, maniacal laugh. <laughs> I started screaming, but that only resulted in him laughing harder. <laughs> I had to get out of this cab. I reached for the door handle, but heard the mechanical clang of the doors being locked. I started pounding on the window and screaming like a madwoman as the cab continued to pick up speed and fly through intersections with reckless abandon. As he ran through a red light, I spotted a police car near the intersection. I prayed that they saw us and let out a breath of relief when I saw the police car activate its flashing lights and pull behind the cab. As the cab driver gawked at the police car in the rearview mirror, he let loose with an endless tapestry of expletives. Within a few seconds, the cab came to a skidding halt against a sidewalk, knocking over several garbage cans in the process. The driver then bolted from the cab and ran off into the night. The police gave chase, but weren't able to catch him. Later, after doing a thorough inspection of the cab, investigators found DNA evidence of four missing women. I was almost the fifth. In 1967, I worked for the Sheriff's Department in a very small town with the population of approximately 1,000 people. The Sheriff's Department was very much like that of Mayberry in the Andy Griffith Show. There was a sheriff and me, the deputy. That was it. And we were true peace officers. We weren't law enforcers who were there to collect commerce for the town. We were there to do nothing more than to help keep the peace. And that we did. It was an extremely quiet Sunday afternoon. Church service had long since ended and most of the churchgoers had already had lunch and went back home. Sunday afternoons were the quietest days in our town. All of the stores in downtown were closed and the local diner shut down shop early at 3 o'clock. The sheriff was off that day and I was manning the station by myself. Of course, it being Sunday, there was nothing for me to do, so I was leaning back in my chair with my feet propped up on my desk. I was deeply engrossed in a detective novel when the door to the sheriff's office flung open and a young boy rushed in. I guessed the boy to be no more than ten years old. He was terrified about something. He collapsed into my arms and was breathing so rapidly that he was near hyperventilation. He kept repeating the same words over and over. They're gone. They're all gone. The boy wasn't going to be helpful in relaying whatever information he had until he calmed down, so I sat him down in a chair and instructed him to take several long, 
deep breaths. I then gave him a glass of water. I assured him that he was going to be okay and that I wouldn't let anything happen to him. After a few minutes, he had settled down enough to speak somewhat coherently. It turns out the boy was from the nearby town of Stark. It was a tiny town with a population of about 200. The town itself didn't consist of much. There was a little general store, a small diner, and a town hall. Stark was a farming community, so the neighboring houses were all spread far apart outside of the town. They're gone. They're all gone. Who's gone? The entire town. I asked him if he knew where they went. He just said, They took everyone. Who took everyone? The boy looked up at me with fear-filled eyes and spoke in a hushed tone. Them. Since the diner was still open, I brought the boy there and bought him some lunch. I told Mary Lou, who was running the diner that day, to watch the kid until I got back. I was going to check out the town of Stark to see what was going on. Stark was about 15 miles away. When I pulled into the town, I saw several cars parked in spaces near the buildings that made up the township. So clearly there were many people there on this day. When I stepped outside of my vehicle, I immediately noticed how quiet everything was. I could hear the gentle breeze of the day and nothing more. Not a peep. If as many people were here as the vehicles indicated, I would expect to see a few on the sidewalks and to hear some chatter coming from at least one of the buildings. There was nothing but silence, so I inspected further. My first stop was Town Hall. Their Town Hall was not much more than an office with a large meeting room. I stepped into the building. I noticed a flyer on the wall that indicated a scheduled meeting for that day. According to the flyer, it seemed that the farmers were going to be discussing the rumbling underground that they had all been experiencing lately. That piqued my curiosity, so I stepped into the meeting room. It appeared that they had indeed gotten together that day to discuss something. There was an arrangement of chairs all set up, but the room was in disarray. There were chairs and papers thrown all about the room. But the oddest thing was the hole. There was a gigantic sinkhole in the middle of the room. I stood over it and looked down. It was pitch black. I shined the beam of my flashlight down, but the light was swallowed up by the darkness. I stepped out of the town hall and entered the general store next door. There was no sign of life and the place was a mess. Food, feed bags, and other items within the store were thrown about as if there were some kind of struggle or riot. And there was another hole. It was in the center of the store. The tiled floor had been churned up and there was a mound of dirt surrounding the hole. Again, I looked down into it. It was deep and dark. I could not see anything. I hurried out of the general store and ran across the street to the diner. People had been there eating. The booths still had plates with food on them. The counter had multiple cups of coffee, still full. The grill in back was hot, with burnt food sizzling on it. But no people. Everyone had vanished, and obviously they all left very abruptly. I walked behind the counter and stepped through the swinging doors in the back kitchen area. There was another hole in the floor. It was like the other two, as if something had burrowed up from under the ground and emerged into the diner. Again, I looked down into the hole. Unlike the others, this hole didn't drop straight down. This one was more of an incline that gradually went down into the earth. With my flashlight in one hand and my revolver in the other, I stepped down into the hole and started walking deep down into the ground. The beam from my flashlight did nothing to help me see in front of me. It was simply too dark. But when I shone the light on the walls, I could make out gargantuan claw marks. It didn't look smooth or rhythmic like I would have expected if a machine had tunneled this hole. 
These marks were unique and chaotic. I continued walking for what seemed like hours, but in reality it was likely just a few minutes, until I stepped into a room. I say room, but it was more like an enormous cavern. The ceilings had to be more than a hundred feet tall, and I could see. I could see in this room due to the light spilling in from the two holes above me. The holes from the town hall and general store buildings. And then I spotted the town folk. They were all lying in a pile. They had clearly been dropped down into the cavern from the holes above. Their bodies were distorted and misshapen from the fall, and then ravaged and torn apart by... them. My mind began to wonder what kind of monster could have done this, but my imagination wasn't necessary, as I saw one of them step out from the shadows. The beast picked up one of the town folk and began chewing on them like one might expect to see a dog gobbling up a piece of meat. The creatures were unlike anything I had ever seen. They were massive. They had to be 12 feet tall. Their skin was smooth and yellow, and they were rippling with muscles upon muscles. There was no fat on these creatures. They looked like a mass of moving muscles. Their legs were short compared to the trunk of their bodies, and their hands were titanic. They were like bulldozer hands with long, thick talons. Their necks were minimal as they disappeared into their broad shoulders and their heads were round and bald. The jaws on these creatures were like dump trucks with jagged, blood-stained teeth. Their eyes were hauntingly sinister, beady, and burning bright red. I watched on in horror as countless other creatures stepped forward out of the darkness and began feeding on the town people, ripping them apart and some even swallowing them whole. They hadn't seen me or I too would be inside their gullet, so I remained still hoping they would go away and allow me an easy escape. I had to hold back my vomit multiple times as I continued to watch them feast, but finally... They stopped, and to my dismay, began scaling the walls and using their claws to pull dirt back into the room. It took me a moment to realize that they were in the process of plugging the holes they had created, and they were moving quickly. The town hall hole was filled in no time, and they were halfway finished with filling the general store hole when I realized I had to make my move now, or I would be trapped down here with them. I turned and ran faster than I ever had in my life and was able to emerge from the hole to get back into the diner. I collapsed in the corner of the room and caught my breath. Within a few seconds I could see the hole being filled from underneath. It took all of two minutes for that entire tunnel to be filled. It was an odd sight to be sure. The tile of the floor was pushed to the sides to reveal an innocent dirt spot under the flooring. No one would have ever guessed that these were once holes that led to the guts of the earth below. I never told anybody. What good would it have done? The people of Stark were all dead, and who in their right mind would have believed me? The creatures had filled in the holes so I had no proof. I was aware of how preposterous the whole story sounded. Everyone would have thought I had lost my mind. I probably would have been thrown in the loony bin. So, all these years, I kept this to myself. But here I am now, a frail old man who has withered away to nothing more than a skeleton wrapped in wrinkled flesh. I'm not much longer for this world, and this was not a tale. I wanted to take with me to the grave.